Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a review as this allows my content to get in front of more people. And thank you for that. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. I focus on root cause healing and that oftentimes starts with the Carnivore Cures meat only elimination diet. Today, I'm very excited to introduce you to Dr. Peg Dettilio. She is one of these SIRS providers, but she does not just focus on SIRS. She does all environmental illnesses, which includes toxins in our environment, such as forever chemicals, toxins in our water, heavy metals, lime, other tick bites, including alpha-gal, although we didn't really touch upon alpha-gal and I apologize for that, but, um, and also SIRS or mold illness. She talks about the terrain, about the importance of the health of our body, and then also as well as our environment. We talk about so many things of how to make this less overwhelming and what we should do when it comes to Lyme or when it comes to mold or when it comes to SIRS, when it comes to heavy metals. We also talk a lot about Marcon's, which is the nasal infection. And we talk a little bit more about that. There's a lot of information in this conversation. And Dr. Peg has just shared a lot of her time with us to talk about it. Dr. Peg Dettilio is a clinical director, and she's had extensive experience treating various environmental illnesses, such as tick-borne illness, which includes Lyme, Bartonella, and Babesia, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, including mold toxicity, methylation cycle issues, mast cell activation syndrome, leaky gut, SIBO, and bioidentical hormone replacement. She uses an integrative medical model using pharmaceutical, nutraceutical, lifestyle changes, and exercise programs to facilitate wellness. Peg is a certified clinician in the Shoemaker Protocol for SIRS, and she's worked with over a thousand SIRS patients over the past 10 years, and she understands the nuances of the symptoms that each patient presents. Peg is also trained in the Bredesen Protocol as a RECODE 2.0 clinician treating Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia afflicting patients. She is also certified as an Opus 23 practitioner, which is a genetic interpretation program in which she curates a report from an analysis of a patient's genetic code. I really love Dr. Peg because she's holistic and she treats everything and the body and the environment as one. And so it's not just this one protocol that will fix everybody. She really makes it also very simple and very approachable for the individual person. And that's oftentimes why I recommend her for most of my SIRS clients. Every SIRS person that I work with needs a different type of support. But if you have a lot of multi-system, multi-symptom illnesses, you may have been bit by a tick once in your life, or you've been bit somewhere and you feel that that's also affected your health, or you've lived in mold long-term, Dr. Peg is a great resource. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. Peg. I'm very excited to have you on today. I am so excited to introduce you to my community that so desperately needs a lot of your support. So uh, for the people that don't know you that are listening and watching, if you can introduce yourself. Yes, well, thank you for having me, Judy. I like the opportunity to talk about the environmental world and the integrative world that I live in and uh, hope that I can shed some light on um, some important issues for your, uh, your members today. I have been actually a primary care family nurse practitioner for 28 years in Southern New Hampshire. And for three of those years, I worked with two older family physicians that were the original family physicians in uh, this region and adored them and learned a lot from them. And then when they sold the practice, I decided to open my own. So for 25 years, I've had a full spectrum uh, family practice with three generations often. And and that's been lovely. And um, I've enjoyed it immensely. About 10 years ago, however, the area that I work in is an endemic area for tick-borne illness. And so I was faced with all of these dilemmas about Lyme disease that I was treating per the the protocol, the standard protocol that didn't seem to improve. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a great deal of time trying to uh, solve that dilemma. Why was that? You have two organizations that are opposed in their protocols and, and really started to look at that. I actually fell into Dr. Shoemaker's work and chronic inflammatory response syndrome in my effort to follow the Lyme research because he had done some work with Lyme and that opened up a whole nother arena. And it, and then it really became quite clear 
why people were not getting better often with standard treatment. And we can talk about that a little bit more. But over the last 10 years, I've really tried to develop the environmental part of my practice, Regenix Healing. I was a founding diplomat for the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness and was their uh, first treasurer. And I also sit on a legislative commission in New Hampshire, the New Hampshire Commission for Environmentally Triggered Chronic Diseases, and looking at a whole lot of other arsenic and lead and PFAS chemicals and having you know, the members of the commission be state, state employees who work in environmental medicine, legislators, it's all very exciting. A little sad some days because the problems are real and diffuse. And I also started a very small group, probably 20, 25 at the most, called the Northeast Environmental Illness Alliance. And this is a very informal group, but we meet quarterly. And the purpose is to share information. It's a a no judgment zone in the sense that people from different points of view can come and share their point of view and, and people listen without critical comments and that kind of thing. So it's a nice uh, informal, so, somewhat of a social group as well, because we're all pretty isolated sometimes in the work that we do. So that's me. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for the introduction. And I joined that alliance meeting, uh, I think it was a couple months ago. And while it's informal, and everyone is nice, as you said, it's, I felt it was super educational in terms of what other people are doing and questions that, as you said, that can be supported when we are isolated in our own work. But shifting. um, So talking, let's talk a little bit about Lyme, you know, what uh, if you can talk a little bit about the illness, and then what is standard treatment, and then also What are co-infections with Lyme? Yeah, so of course, um, ticks today are a bit like little stealth bombers, right? They they can carry many different infections. And uh, what we know about them is that your chance of having one of these other infections other than Lyme, if the tick is carrying it, is actually quite high because those infections tend to sit more toward the, the mouth. In the, in the cheeks of the, of the tick versus in the gut where the Lyme tends to sit. So they can carry many infections. And unfortunately, Lyme disease in the United States has, um, has many issues, has uh, created a lot of emotion over the disagreement about diagnosis and treatment. If you look at how long Lyme disease has been around, the 5,000 year old um, man that was pulled out of the Alps, the, the frozen man, had Borrelia DNA extracted from his bones. So it's not a new infection, uh, Lyme disease, but it is very controversial still in terms of the way it's, it's treated and evaluated. In the mainstream Infectious Disease Society of America, which writes the guidelines for providers of care in, in the United States. Lyme disease, whether you've had it for 20 years or one month, is treated the same. Oh. And typically, um, the range now says two to four weeks of doxycycline or amoxicillin or one of those standards. Now, some people with acute Lyme disease uh, will be certainly, uh, it will resolve with that treatment, but many people not. And this is the whole issue of other complicating immune dysregulators. And why would a person not be able to recover with standard treatment? Many times it's because the immune system just is not organized enough to do that. And it is a complex infection, uh, Borrelia. So it can change its form. It can become intracellular. So it's not just always floating around in the bloodstream. It also can form cysts around itself. And as any bacteria, it can hide under biofilm. So it can become quite challenging when it's been there for a while. And typically the ILADS community, the International Society for for Lyme and Associated Diseases, which is the group that has been extremely active for the last 20 years or more, in um, trying to educate about the challenges of of eradicating or managing these infections. And their protocols are quite different and much more aggressive and lengthy. 
in my own experience, for 28 years being in an endemic area, I've treated a lot of Lyme disease. And I, my uh, impression is that if the person has an organized immune system, then it is fairly straightforward often to treat it. But this underlying uh, toxicity, whether through mold or whether through heavy metals or other things that people are unaware they're toxic from can be complicators. And then what about the infections, um, the co-infection? So are they, do they have to be treated separately? Is it sometimes just the antibiotics and, or is it, you know, the treatment that we do for SERS protocol? Yeah. So the co-infections have often different treatments than the treatment for the Lyme. So for Babesia, just as an example, uh, Babesia is a parasite that resides in the red cells and it's similar um, to malaria because that's where malaria sits as well. A little more complex in terms of the DNA structure and things, but you have to treat Babesia either with an anti-malarial herb or with an anti-malarial medication, which you would not use for Lyme disease. So the treatments can vary. I personally, before I was SERS literate, my treatment of tick-borne illness, particularly Lyme, was much more aggressive and much more standard in terms of antibiotics. Having done more work with SERS and the dysbiosis that occurs and having patients come to me now as new people with SERS who say, I've been on my Lyme antibiotics for three years and I'm no better than when I started. And it's always devastating to hear that in a history on a first visit because Truly, we have to do a better job of organizing the immune system first. And if you're going to use the antibiotics, then use them judiciously. The herbs can be used really quite extensively to do the lion's share of the job. And we have master herbalists like Stephen Buhner in the country, who's a prolific writer and publisher on herbal treatments. So it's not, we're not guessing, we know what works. And it, it just, we need to be more thoughtful about protecting the gut in, because as you know, it's very difficult to turn that around. I've heard of protocols where they recommend antibiotics for six months, maybe a year for Lyme. I never knew that people use it for years and years. So that's shocking. Yeah. So the, the fundamental problem is with these folks is if the person who's treating them for Lyme neglects to ask them about mold. Right. then they don't really appreciate that the immune system is not organized. If you're in a cytokine storm from exposure to mold, you are not going to be able to effectively treat and deal with an infection that's atypical. You know, it's like asking your, if your corporate officer is, is demented, how is your business going to run? You know, the immune system is fundamental to to fighting these infections. And if it, it can't do its job well, then you will be treating for a very long time right. um, and not getting anywhere. So yeah, so that leads to the issue of typically, almost exclusively, if someone has uh, an issue with mold exposure and SIRS, then the mold is dealt with first. Okay. And then the infections are really very straightforward. It happens all the time. Out of curiosity, so then let's say, and we'll get um, more basic after after this question that I'm curious about, but so if you were to treat someone with SIRS that p- has the Lyme as well, would you ever at a later point put them on antibiotics? I usually don't need to, to okay. be honest. That's what I figured. I, I usually don't need to. Acute Lyme, um, so somebody say, if, this would be more apt to happen in my primary care practice. I get a call that um, somebody had, you know, flu-like symptoms. They think they have a bullseye rash. They had, they, they know this is a very straightforward, easy case. You know, four weeks ago, they removed an angora tick from them. So everything fit the way it should. It doesn't usually happen that way, but, but say that was the case, then that I would put that person on antibiotics for, for the four to six weeks, usually doxycycline or amoxicillin if, if it's a child. And if you catch it that quick, then that is effective treatment. Right. It's not long-term. You put them on a probiotic, you, you know, all the stuff that we do to protect the gut for that six-week period. And, uh, but for 
for a lime uh, situation that pops up when you're treating mold. So let me just give you a, a classic kind of scenario. Okay. The person comes in, they have mold illness. That's why they're coming in. We always have on the differential list that the person could have tick-borne illness. It's always considered, mm -hmm. always. But there's no evidence when they first come in. Their C3A is normal. Their Lyme tests are not impressive. And so we, we move forward with treating the mold. And the person, we move them from their bad environment or they fix their environment and they're on their binder and they're moving forward. And, and I'm getting the emails periodically. Oh, I, I had a window of feeling better this morning. A couple of hours, I felt like my old self again. And then that leads to, oh, I had a, I had a day. I did quite well. Eventually you get the message. I haven't felt this good in a long time. So then I just wait because once I get that message, periodically, the next message is what just happened, I feel horrible. And the what just happened, I feel horrible was that the immune system improved with the mold detoxing. Mm -hmm. And now you have an organized immune system that can see the infection that was there all along. So you pull that person in or order their a tick-borne panel, you get a C3A, a C6 peptide, the, the, the markers that we know will change when there's acute uh, Lyme, and acute Lyme means that the immune system is able to see it, and the C3A is high, the C6 peptide is uh, positive, and usually it's six weeks or so of treatment. Okay, so let's take a step back and explain, I mean, there's so many different variations for mold support. I know you follow closely the Shoemaker protocol. Can you talk about maybe why cholestyramine or wall call sometimes is a more effective binder than, you know, we hear about these other like activated charcoal and while they may be good for heavy metals and stuff, it's not the same. And then I, I guess you really touched upon how SIRS and Lyme is different, but if you can just explain the differences of mold treatment, because I so often hear oh, I went to a mold doctor and they're not uh, shoemaker certified. And then they're either told that as long as you're out of exposure, you'll be fine, even if they have the haplotype, um, or they'll be told that they just need a light natural binder and they should be fine. Yeah. So the, the polarity or the electrical charge on the different binders is really the critical piece. Right. What we know about the burden from mold exposure in the body is that most of the burden is spores and spore particulates versus mycotoxins, which is a much smaller burden in, in the body. Okay. So if your goal is to remove spores and spore particulates, th then you need a positively charged binder because those are negatively charged. And your cholestyramine and your cholesalvamin or well call are positively charge binders that do the best job at removing spores. They're timed differently, of course. Cholestyramine is timed before the meal, before the fat, always fat because fat invites the bile into the small intestine and you need to have that attraction between the binder and the bile that's holding on to the spores. And it prevents that bile from being reabsorbed, the liver is forced to make new bile that is not spore contaminated. And then ultimately the spores are pulled out of the fat tissue where they're stored, make their way to the liver. And depending on the body burden, it can take just a few months or it can take longer than that sometimes to remove. And then what about the mycotoxin? So would the, I guess the more herbal versions help that? And I know you said it's less of a burden, but I mean, there's so many people that go after those. So just your thoughts. Yeah. So the mycotoxins would be more effectively removed by other binders. Okay. So your uh, charcoal and clay are used for that. Dr. Shoemaker worked with charcoal early in the research okay. with his, with the SERS population and found that it, it did not reverse symptoms like the cholestyramine and the wall call did, they, they worked well. Okay. And then what about environmental toxins? So you just mentioned that you're part of committees and you focus a lot on environmental toxins. So what does that include? And then you mentioned how, I think the last time we chatted, you mentioned how gas 
um, our natural gas in our homes is very quite toxic for some children and how it affects asthma. If you can talk a little bit about that, please. Yeah, so we really have a toxic world, don't we? You know, and we, we have really seen the enemy and it is us. A lot of the problems that we have are because of choices that as a population that we make. To the issue of the gas, natural and propane gas byproducts can be toxic to everyone, and particularly people with HLA haplotypes that don't clear VOCs well. So what is important in any structure is ventilation. And if you have a home that's built very tightly and doesn't ventilate well, and you have a gas stove, sometimes vented, I'm amazed at how many people have gas stoves that are not properly vented so that, that does the air isn't pulled out. Those VOCs can be toxic and can cause symptoms just by themselves. I had a case not too long ago. The woman came in for a new patient appointment. Her only symptom was headache. And I didn't really see it in time enough to say, maybe you should be seeing someone else because there's lots of people that can deal with headache. And I'm very happy to do that, but it didn't seem really appropriate. Right. But what it turned out was she thought she had mold exposure because they moved into a new house. The first night she and her husband slept there, she woke up the next morning with a very bad headache and it didn't go away. And for some reason, someone had suggested maybe the new house is moldy and that's why she made the appointment. I said, well, mold wouldn't work that way. You know, it's not a single symptom thing like that. But I started to ask her more questions about her environment. And in fact, they had, um, they had a gas stove and they had gas to be used for their heating as well. And ultimately it turned out that it was the gas that was causing her headache. Oh. The house was very tight. So I guess my advice would be that for anyone that has gas, particularly stoves, just make sure that you that it's well vented. Sometimes people actually leave, you know, the window open a crack in the in the kitchen. Okay. When they're using the stove, if they feel like they don't have good ventilation, certainly that's a consideration today. The other toxicities that we're faced with pretty diffusely are the PFAS chemicals. So the perfluorinated um, chemicals that are now diffusely present in, in water supplies. From us, that's from industry that puts these things out in the air and they come come down into the water supplies. And also in where our refuse is stored, often those places are not really intact and, and there's contamination that gets out into the water supply. So PFAS chemicals are being studied now. Interestingly enough, uh, my, the experts that I, that I uh, deal with on the commission, so Dr. Patali, who's the toxicologist in environmental services in New Hampshire says that cholestyramine is being looked at in the research centers as an, as an agent to remove these PFAS chemicals. It's not ready for prime time yet. It's mm -hmm. still, it's still in uh, research centers, but it's shown some positive results. And wouldn't that be interesting if cholestyramine ended up being the agent to help people uh, if they tested positive for a high body burden of PFAS chemicals as well, but they're cancer causing uh, chemicals in Merrimack, New Hampshire, which is in the Southern tier of the state. There is an, uh, a company that has been contaminating the air uh, and the water for quite some time. And the population of Merrimack is now on bottled water and has been for some time. And the cancer statistics were just tabulated in December of last year. And we know that there's an association, it's not causation, but there's an association between PFAS chemicals and uh, kidney cancer. And in fact, when they uh, tabulated the renal cancer rates in New Hampshire, Merrimack, New Hampshire had twice the state average and three times the national average. Wow. So, you know, it's, it's, these things are important and they need to be addressed. I did a little bit of research for PFAS um, for my carnivore cure book, but then I watched a documentary on the devil we know. So just for the people that are listening and watching, the PFAS is the forever chemicals where a lot of the companies for Teflon or the water resistant jackets or the floss so that it glides better. They use this nonstick material that I think was made from a chemical called C8. 
and now it it does not disintegrate and so then it's in our water supplies and so if anyone doesn't know much about this i highly recommend watching the devil we know no and that's one of the reasons why i do not recommend anyone drinking tap water or even well water for that matter yes yeah so let's shift a little bit um, and talk a little bit about Marcon. So there's a nasal part of the whole shoemaker protocol. And a lot of people will come to me with, I've had severe sinus congestions my whole life. I've had headaches. Um, not to say that Marcon's always has any symptoms. I mean, some people test positive and they said, I was so sure that I wouldn't have had it. And then there's some people that have had sinus issues and they're negative. So can you talk a little bit about Marcon's, what it is, and with everything related to SIRS? Yeah, so there are many people that do outside the shoemaker world that don't feel that Marcon's is important. I would make the argument for trying to deal with this very annoying problem at times, I will admit, and it can be a little bit stressful uh, to manage and eradicate Marcon's. But Marcon's is a colonization of a certain type of bacteria that is ubiquitous in the environment. It's not a particularly scary bacteria. It doesn't cause a lot of infection, these coagulase negative staph, but they basically like to find a place to hang out and just be. So when we use loose regulatory control um, and the MSH uh, hormone, which is part of the Shoemaker uh, protocol to test, when that hormone drops because of environmental illness, then the terrain of the upper nasal passage is left unprotected. And if if you think back to the kind of the controversy with Louis Pasteur in the 1800s and the germ theory and Claude Bernard, who who his comment was, no, it's the terrain it's not the pathogen, it's the terrain. So it reminds us that when the terrain is not well cared for, squatters are going to go there. So Mark Hunts is a squatter. And so people would say, well, why does it matter? Why can't they just be there? Sometimes there seem to be symptoms associated. So there are some patients who will say, when I treat my Mark Hunts, my my sinus area feels better. And when I know the Marcons are back because my sinus symptoms are back. But typically, squatters don't create a lot of problems. They're just there. The reason we care about Marcons is that there are toxins that bacteria can produce. And many bacteria produce endotoxins. When they're killed, part of their cell wall will become a toxin. And that will be another problem for the person. But that's the endotoxins are pretty much exclusive to when the bacteria is killed. Marcons produce exotoxins, EXO. And the difference is that they can be produced while the bacteria is just there existing. So when you think about it, you have a bacteria that's producing toxins all the time, right on the bridge of the brain, and known to it impede with the MSH molecules. So as the hypothalamus starts to make more MSH, as the person's getting better, the Marcon's exotoxins will cleave the molecule. So you, your MSH will never level, will never come up. And so the Marcon's is as irritating as it is sometimes with the nasal sprays. And sometimes you have to be on them for quite a few months um, to try to manage it. it My opinion is, and I've done this for a long time, and it's always a celebration when the MSH comes up. The Marcons aren't there, and you see you get some rise in the MSH, which then can manage your hormonal situation better. So there's definitely a benefit there to, to deal with them. And then how do you test for Marcons? And do you think that everyone that tests for Marcons alone and not do the SIRS panel are, is it often that if you have Marcons, you most likely have SIRS? Or can somebody have Marcons without having SIRS? Yeah, so Marcons is tested with a nasal culture from uh, Microbiology DX in Bedford, Mass. Our, our good friend and our treasure, Dr. Joseph Musto, who 
loves to talk to people and answer questions for anyone that might want to talk Marcons. Dr. Musto is always makes himself very available uh, to talk about them. But if you were asked Dr. Musto, he would say that by far the majority of people with Marcons have SIRS. There is a small minority of people that would not have SIRS, but would be immunocompromised in some manner where the immune system just wasn't helping that the terrain. manage the terrain and the squatters were coming in. If the MSH goes up, then you, then you don't need to keep treating because the, the, once the MSH is up, it will manage the terrain again. And we don't see a mark on um, in people when the MSH is, is okay. uh, at a good level. Okay. And then how do you treat Marcons? I know you mentioned that there's a spray, but is there something that you recommend? Well, there's a whole toolbox. And here's, this is kind of where I think the the individual clinician and their experience in making the selection is probably the most important factor. For myself, you know, originally we had the BEG spray bag, which was Batraban, EDTA, and gentamicin. So two antibiotics and a bio, uh, biofilm degrader, very aggressive and could eradicate a Marcon's quite well before resistance patterns changed. But this is the thing that we learned back to the terrain and back to just nature. There are other colonizers in the upper nasal passage that actually help keep Marcon's out. And the Staph aureus is one. If, if I have a, do a culture and the person has staph aureus, they're not going to have Marcons. And I celebrate the fact that they have staph aureus there because it's a bigger dinosaur. It keeps the Marcons away. So it doesn't make sense sometimes to use an overly aggressive treatment because then you do a score, you have a scorched earth policy. You, you probably don't want a scorched earth policy in the, in the upper nasal passage because you wanna preserve the other colonizers that are not gonna be problems squatting there. We still have BEG and it has a role in certain cases when you might wanna just get in there because the person's been treating for a while and you, and you wanna just use it short term to try and get things under control and then switch over to something of a lesser aggressiveness. We use EDTA by itself. We use EDTA with silver. We sometimes, you know, resources, you know, every, every decision we make about treatment has many components. How sensitive is the person? How, um, how what are the resources? Um, so if they can't afford uh, a compounded uh, spray, then Dr. Musto helped us all out by taking over the counter X-Lear. X-L-E-A-R, it's xylitol and grapefruit seed extract. And he tested it in the laboratory and it did quite well against fairly highly resistant Marcons. So sometimes, depending on the patient's situation, a very sensitive person, I might start with x first and just have them do that for a while. And then we always can switch to a compound if it seems like the x isn't working. Hopkinton drug in Hopkinton Mass does have some other options that I have not used as extensively. So I, I, I think maybe other practitioners may be better to comment on the effectiveness of the, there's, some, there's an herbal combination and there's one with some witch hazel, I believe. Um, and Dr. Musto is looking at hydrogen peroxide. He's convinced that this, is, that this is going to be a very good treatment, the form that would not be toxic. And I think you might hear something down the road about that. It's a work in progress. So. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question. Uh, one of the biggest questions I get when people test their genetic type to see if they have chronic inflammatory response syndrome. So the 30% that cannot remove mold in their body. One question they get is, so some of them, we see the genetic type with multiple susceptibility, and then there's one specific for mold, and then there's one specific for Lyme. So then some people will ask me, oh, I only have the mold gene. So does that mean I'm only sensitive to mold? And then the other people that have Lyme will say, oh, so does that mean I'm only susceptible to Lyme? So am I struggling with Lyme since the mold genetic part, it was not found. Are you able to uh, share a little bit so more about that? The HLA haplotypes, um, you know, are a great guide for those people that are going to have the most trouble. 
But when you look at patient experience, so for example, uh, the, a family where the, the wife and the three children have uh, poor mold clearance, but when the father was tested, he was just a 15651. He was a post Lyme. Okay. So if he had Lyme disease and was treated for that, he would not clear that well, and he would need a binder to help him. Mm. Father was impacted by the mold and needed a binder to improve some markers, but he never was as sick as the others okay. who had the poor, the genes for poor mold clearance. So you have to remember that um, sometimes it's just burden of exposure. So if the exposure is very high, even in a sick building, even, even a person without the genetics right. working in a sick building can, can not feel well there, right? If the burden is high enough. Yes. And so there, there are situations like that, but typically a post Lyme haplotype is not going to have the same trouble that a mold haplotype or a multi haplotype has uh, with mold exposure in my experience. Okay. So, it, and then if somebody just has the mold haplotype, would they have less of an issue with Lyme or is it just really individually specific? Yeah. So they would likely have less of an issue clearing die off from a Lyme treatment. Although I never take a chance. I just, if, if the person has Lyme as well, they're going to be on a positive binder to help with the die off just to facilitate things. And it's a relative do no harm. You know, we make decisions about what to do uh, moving with an abundance of caution. The consideration always should be what is the risk of the treatment I'm recommending? You know, if there's not a clear cut reason to do it, if the risk is low, but there might be some benefit, then that's how I will do it. Okay. And that would be the case for binders. And then in terms of the binder, so there are some people that will take cholestyramine or wall collar and they immediately notice they feel a little bit better, but then there's some people that take it and they feel really bad. So sometimes it's considered too strong of a binder. Generally, what, why do you see that happening with some of the people? So it, it depends on their body burden okay. and it's not really possible through history to know for, for certain how much exposure that person's had since they were born. So I just remind people, since you were born, places that you lived, worked, went to school, otherwise spent time where you might've had exposure, you could have accumulated spores during that time and not been sick. They're just collecting. So a person with a, a fairly clean, say childhood under 18, that did, doesn't have a history of the 1,800-year-old farmhouse with the, with the dirt basement. You know, that's a no-brainer. If someone said they grew up in that house and they have poor mold clearance, you know they have, they have a substantial burden that they've accumulated over time. But for the person that doesn't have that history, then it can be much simpler. And typically, they don't have the same challenge with the stronger binder. But the two considerations for people who don't do well with, this, with one of the, our traditional binders is sometimes the, the gut issues are so complex in that person that they're just not going to do well until, until that's calmed down a little bit. That would not be the population of people that are on, say, the carnivore because their guts are nice, they're healing. But there's a, you know, I have many patients that are eating the wrong things still, you know, and doing a lot of stuff. And then the other thing is people have to re remember that if you're not in a good environment, that's the first step in the shoemaker protocol. And sure, I have many patients who I treat who are not yet in a good environment because to not do something doesn't seem to be the, the greater good, right. right? But I am always extremely cautious in treating someone with a binder who's in a bad environment, because if you treat too aggressively, you can unmask them to the degree they will not do well in their, they can't be in their house anymore. I mean, they may not feel well in their house before the treatment, but if I create a situation where they can't be in their house, because now they feel so bad, then that can be not helpful. Okay. If they no. don't have another place to go. And I feel that I've seen that. So some people, their ERMI score, their environmental test score for mold comes out pretty high. 
they still start with small doses and even the small doses they start reacting to. And oftentimes it's the environment isn't clean. So um, I, I've seen that often too. How much do you think diet matters in SIRS and Lyme and even these environmental illnesses? Yeah. So again, I guess I would address it as the terrain, the, the terrain of the gut being the most important thing. And when you eat poorly, a poor quality sugar, um, inflammatory things, and you're not going to have a healthy terrain. We know that the gut is the second brain and so many things, neurotransmitters are produced there. We know that histamine is more apt to be an issue when the gut is not healthy. So to good nutrition is fundamental to getting better. Uh, in all things, whether you're talking about diabetes or you're talking about environmental illness. And I've also seen that one benefit of eating carnivore, a higher fat diet is because then you can tolerate the binder more. It may have, you may have already been stimulating the gallbladder enough to release bile, which for people on a low fat diet, they might have a sluggish bile. And so they may even have to do support there first. And so that's another benefit I've seen personally. Yes, I would agree with that. Yes. And then what about heavy metals? So I know I've asked you before, you know, do we treat because a lot of times people will say no, no, the first thing we have to treat is mercury, mercury is the first thing just wanted your thoughts about heavy metals in general, and all of this um, protocols. Yeah, so I can only speak from my experience of the last 10 years, particularly doing the environmental medicine, I have a very straightforward and simple approach. I try to keep, I follow the KISS principle, keep it simple, <laughs> choose your, choose one thing and, and work on that and then go to your, your next thing. Okay. And I, I agree there are many people who will, will address metals first. That's not been my approach. My approach is um, if mold is present, that's the first thing. You have to really improve the immune system. If then tick-borne illnesses, then I would do that second and I would approach the metals third. Now, the caveat to that is I routinely test for five heavy metals in my initial blood work for people. And that is because I am interested to know whether they have a current exposure to those things. So lead, cadmium, arsenic, uh, mercury, and aluminum are. And frequently, they will um, have one or more of those elevated um, on just initial blood work, which just tells me that in the last few weeks, this person has had exposure because the blood, the straightforward blood work is not going to tell you about 10 years ago. You have to do right different, different kinds of testing for that. But at least in the Northeast of, of um, the United States, we see a lot of high arsenic from the, from the, like in New Hampshire, we have exceptionally high arsenic levels because of the granite it's naturally occurring in the water. So if people are testing their well water, and this is Massachusetts and Connecticut as well, if they're not testing their well water, then, uh, and they have high levels of arsenic, that's inflammatory and is also a carcinogen. So immediately, if on that initial blood work, if the arsenic level is high, then I'm going to start a querying about, um, are you eating a lot of rice? Because rice is high in arsenic. Are you eating a lot of non-organic chicken because that can be high in arsenic? Have you tested your water? And probably putting them on um, a silica supplement right, right out of the gate. Fiji water is the easiest. It removes arsenic and aluminum. And it was actually studied, very small study, never duplicated, looking at people with early dementia. And it was a small group, 15, I think. And basically the, the researchers were trying to see whether um, aluminum made a difference for in, in the cognitive impairment of any of these people. So they did a full spectrum neuropsych testing at baseline. And then the only intervention was they had the people drink a quart of Fiji water a day for three months. Now Fiji water is very high in silica. And so they repeated the neuropsych testing at the end of the three months and three of the people had statistically significant improvement in their cognition. So those were people that do, that somewhere had had aluminum exposure and it was there and it, it's, a, it's a neural inflammagen. So lead, um, mercury and aluminum are the big neurotoxin metals. So if aluminum is high or arsenic is high on that testing, then I'm, I'm going to introduce something right away. 
Okay. I would I wait to do mercury until after if the people are eating, if they're multi susceptible and they're eating a lot of fatty fish, I counsel them at that time, maybe this is not the best choice for you, you know, just in case you're you're storing that that mercury. Okay. And then um what about oral health? How does that impact uh chronic illness? Yeah, so there's a plethora of research on what happens when the gums are unhealthy and the, there's an overgrowth of bacteria. I mean, we have a normal amount of bacteria, right? The terrain is normal. There's a normal amount of bacteria in the oral cavity. But when the gums are not when unhealthy and the teeth are unhealthy, you have an abundance of bacteria. And that has been shown to create systemic inflammation and cardiovascular risk and you know other risks we really want to have a goal of reducing inflammation from all sources we want to be as as low in inflammation a body burden as we can so taking care of the gums and the teeth are, are important for for as a has a role in that right and sometimes even going to a traditional dentist is not enough to maybe you get a bad root canal or you do certain things and I'm not a dentist at all. So I have no idea, but certain treatments don't really remove the inflammation in your gums and teeth long-term. Um, I I've had some clients have to go to a biological dentist and they show in the 3d cone beam scan that they have to remove certain things. The gums are bad. And so I know it could get super costly, but um, that's always something that I've seen where certain people for SIRS, they need to take care of their or oral health as well. Yes. And I think what you're alluding to might be the cavitations that can also develop. So cavitations are unfortunately an expensive deviation for people with Marcons and thankfully it doesn't happen frequently. But what we know is that where teeth have been removed, extracted, right. if soft tissue has been left in that extraction site, so some ligament tissue, some soft tissue, and the person had Marcons, those places can colonize with Marcons. Oh, okay. And so when that happens, they, they, they eat or ingest all the soft tissue, and then they start to work on the bone when there's no more soft tissue. So then cavitations are identified on a cone beam CT when there's areas of bone thinning on the CT and the person is you know, known to have some of these other issues. So in that circumstance, the biologic dentist or oral surgeon who, is, who works on cavitations needs to open that area back up where the tooth was extracted, clean out the area, mm -hmm and put, you know, antimicrobial solution in there so that when it heals, there are the bacteria are not there anymore. I've had many people take their Marcon's culturette to Dr. Megas in Massachusetts, who I refer to to do the cavitation work, and he will take the culture before he does any cleaning and Marcon's are, are there. Wow. So the problem, if they're, if they're in the cavitation site, you're never going to clear them out of the upper nasal passage because they repopulate. Wow. So even if you're treating Marcon's in the nasal with one of those um, ones that we've mentioned, if it doesn't ever go away, so one of the possibilities can be because it's in maybe you have cavitations? Yes. Yes. Wow. Okay. I usually don't lead with that discussion because <laughs> people are already overwhelmed. Yes. And, and so, but I, but yes, I had someone three weeks ago have okay. their cavitation surgery and get cultured. And yes, there was Marcon's in the site. And interesting enough though, it is an important problem for many people symptomatically. Right. So this particular woman had had chronic left-sided facial pain that we, you know, we, we would presume that was part of her SIRS problem. But as soon as she had the cavitation surgery, within days, once the initial inflammation, that left-sided pain was 50% of what it had been. So that left-sided pain was related to that cavitation. And apparently when Dr. Megas got in there, it, it was very infected. There was a lot of overgrowth of bacteria in there. So it was a significant one. And 
it can create a lot of regional problems for people right. sometimes. I know when on this, um, the SERS community, when I forgot which provider said it, but when hearing that oral health is one of the biggest reasons for heart disease, I never knew that. And, and, and also sleep apnea. So it's quite scary. I didn't realize, I mean, obviously we all know oral health is important, but I didn't realize how many other ways it's connected to the rest of the body. Yes, very much so. So I'm sure a lot of people that have never heard of a lot of these things or have just recently been diagnosed with Lyme or SIRS or even heavy metals, this is quite overwhelming. How do we truncate this? And I'm still trying to figure this out myself, but how do we make this less overwhelming and a more step-by-step approach so that people don't end up over exhausting their limbic system and then needing even retraining for that? Yeah. So I think I would say that uh, what I think is most important right out of the gate is that people have to lose the fear you know, we have to help people not be trying to move forward with fear being a strong force right. and, and hopelessness, which we see. So we have to deal with that right up front and because it becomes a tremendous obstacle to moving forward and to just having a plan. So if you think about any other, the most complex issues can be brought down to lowest common denominators. That's kind of the way I roll. I mean, I don't get caught up in a, in a lot of esoteric kind of multiple treatments at the same time. And, you know, if you keep it simple and you have and, and you and the person who's ill can agree on the approach and the approach is clear. If you think about it, the tortoise and the hare, right? The tortoise one going slower, right? But when you're treating people with multiple problems, it's extremely difficult to evaluate your treatment if you're doing more than one thing at a time, mm-hmm. right? I mean, typically we treat something in say primary care, which I've spent a lot of time in. You have a diagnosis, you have a treatment. If the treatment isn't helping, then you reevaluate your treatment and you reevaluate your diagnosis. But you can evaluate the treatment because you're only doing one thing at a time. Yes. If, if the patient comes in and I say, oh, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for your Lyme disease. And I'm going to do this for your mold. And, and we're, and we're going to, number one, it's, I'm overwhelmed and, and I'm sure <laughs> they're already overwhelmed. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't really help, but to, to, to come in and say, okay, this is what we're going to do first. And this is why we're going to do this first. And we're not going to do this for months before evaluating it to decide if it's not the right treatment or it's not the right diagnosis. So we, just being consistent one thing at a time, but adding on that has, in my experience, been the, the uh, best approach. So you can take someone who feels overwhelmed by, Oh, I have made this lime and I've got this mold thing. And okay, you know, let's just take a breath. Let's bring it down. Let's find out what can be done. Even people who can't leave their moldy homes, in some situations, we'll work with them to set up a, a sanctuary room within the home. Okay. Because literally, if, they, if, if they're underwater with their house, they can't leave their house. What are you going to do? So, right. but, you, but you can make a sanctuary room where, you know, 85 or 90% of the time, that person's in good air. And that's possible. It takes, you know, it takes some work and it takes... Um, some input from from other team members um, to make that happen uh, often, but you know you you just have to treat each person as an individual and their situation and see what can be done. So the the best we can do uh, for that person is what is what we do in the simplest manner possible. And I love that. I think that's very similar and aligned with the carnivore diet we make it very simple with diet. So we eliminate almost everything. And then we try to figure out what is going to support our current issues in our health. And then we slowly bring back things. Maybe it's a variety of meats, maybe it's um, adding some plants back, but that also removes a lot of the noise. And it's just about more about being consistent to then figure out, is this way of eating helping me or not? And then, but without, if we add everything that we can eat, then it becomes really hard. Is it the corn? Is it the soy? Is it the e- eggs? Is it the dairy? And so I think it's a very s- similar approach. And I think people that are listening and watching to this can really relate to what you're saying. 
as we're closing, are there any tips that you recommend for people to even get started in all of this? I mean, is it that they look for a provider? Is it that they test their house? Do they test for Marcon's? What are some of your... So for someone who has, uh, you know, a multi-system, multi-symptom kind of syndrome that, you know, they've had the million dollar workup in the traditional world. And at the end of it all, they're handed a prescription for Prozac because the provider feels that they've exhausted every possibility and they must just be depressed, which happens all the time. And, uh, and you know, we're, we're doing all we can to educate the mainstream providers about this issue so that that doesn't happen. Right. Uh, I really feel honestly that the trauma, in my experience, the patients I've dealt with, the trauma of not being believed by traditional providers of care and being dismissed is actually greater than the disabling illness they have. Wow. It's, it's very traumatic to go to multiple clinicians only to be dismissed or not believed. And we have to do a better job uh, and we have to really get out there um, and, and do that. But so if someone isn't sure, I would say take the VCS test online. People with SIRS can pass it. So it's not a rule out. But if you fail it, then you can be pretty clear that there's probably uh, there's something creating some brain inflammation right. likely. And then um, if you can get it, if you can persuade a provider to at least draw an MSH level. So because very few people with SIRS have normal MSH, I've, I could probably count them on one hand. Right. They've been very unusual cases. But so if you fail the VCS, then you can, you can uh, get an MSH drawn anywhere by anyone um, licensed to do that, and your MSH is, um, you know, below 25, then, then you can have, you can be fairly certain that you have this situation and you could start looking at your environments for potentially where mold is. We, we discourage a little bit. Sometimes people don't know how to do the test, the dust testing. So mm -hmm. I always say, have them seek some advice about how to do that test, because as with any test, the validity depends on the quality of how the test was done. And, and if they take a sample of dust that's 20 years old, that's not necessarily going to give you the current situation, mm -hmm. right? So, so we do counsel a bit on how to do that. And there's a wealth of information on survivingmold.com um, in terms of articles about things and, and IEP documents and, and all of that. So you, there's, there's ways to get the, the research and then the providers of care um, that know mold the best are uh, listed on the, on the Surviving Mold website. And just to clarify, the VCS test is a vision test. I think it's like $10, $15. You could do it from the comfort of your home. You look at a, um, a screen and you try to make out some gray lines that go every which way. And, um, and then there's a symptomology part of it too. Of if, do you have multiple symptoms multiple uh, that affect multiple sy systems? And then oftentimes, if you fail that, there's a very high chance you are suffering from SIRS. I do have a question really quick. So when people fail that, can they actually not have SIRS, but then maybe have Lyme? Or is it not? I don't it remember. The one, it's anything, any brain inflammation okay. Uh, okay. is going to reduce one's ability to perceive contrast, which is what you're measuring. Right. So right. Uh, technically, uh, like a, um, a VOC that's very toxic to a person that creates acute brain inflammation could be a reason why they fail. Heavy metals, if the burden was heavy enough in the brain, that creates inflammation and that could impair. So yes, it's not specific to mold, okay. but typically if the person knows or suspects the musty smell, you know, that's always, that's the, the fun fact I always say that people don't realize that by World Health Organization standards, if there is a musty smell, there is mold. Yes. So the people that just go, well, it's a little musty smell in my basement. We know everybody has that. Well, a lot of people have it, but it's, it's not good. Right. Um, and it does reflect the fact that, that, that there is mold there. If there's no musty smell, it doesn't rule out mold because right. not all the molds make that VOC, but if it's there, it is, um, diagnostic that there's mold somewhere. One large question I get is after people go through the SERS protocol, they graduate, they feel a lot better. Is it that they have to now be careful of everywhere they go in? I mean, grocery stores, churches, I mean, this is a recent question I got. 
you know, people start feeling that overwhelm of now do I need to protect myself from everywhere I go into? So the answer to that might vary depending on the clinician. It's not really part of the protocol per se. Right. So right. in my experience, what I, what I counsel people about is that if they are going to places where they are not sure or they know that there is mold contamination, then their best bet is to use the tools in their toolbox Mm-hmm. Meaning take the binder before you go and take a dose of the binder when you get back. Right. And if they if they had a history of high MMP9, then make sure you're taking your fish oil. If you go away on vacation and you're not sure where you're staying is going to be okay, then just take your toolbox with you. Okay. Take your binder, take your fish oil for those that might be on other things to manage other uh, cytokines, then usually it's a short list. Okay. And, and that usually goes fine. It's it, I say a person with insulin dependent diabetes wouldn't go on vacation somewhere where there wasn't refrigeration or they didn't have the right foods, right? It's, it's just, you don't have to fear it. You just have to plan for it. You okay. just have to know how to manage it. But it, you know, people live their lives robustly and people get better because, you know, people come in the first day, does anybody get better from this? <laughs> Is that get better? And I say, you know what? I'm going to make this about me because if, if no one got better, it would be pretty depressing. And I don't think I would really want to do this work, but I, I look forward to celebrating the, uh, the victory and, and celebrating the return to robust good health. So people do get better. And I think that's the message for anyone with this is that they, they, they need to lose the fear if they can, that they'll never be better. They need to believe that they will be better. That helps in the process. Thank you so much. I, I think a lot of people will appreciate this message from you. It, it does feel like an overwhelming diagnosis, but when you break it out so simply, it's just take it one step at a time and know that you can still live your life. You just, as you said, I never thought about it that way, but you just need to take your insulin around with you and just prepare accordingly. Where can people find you and your practice? And um, if you're taking new patients? <laughs> So um, regenicshealing.com is my website. I'm physically in Southern New Hampshire. So I have a lot of people that in the Northeast that actually physically can come in, but I have a lot of people that are virtual only. The wait right now is a little bit time. I have a full primary care practice that I am letting go at the end of this year. And I gave these patients that I've many, which I've had 28 years, a year's notice to adequately be able to to find the right person, but it it is a lot of people waited to the end. So the schedule has been tough. So new patients right now are, are a little bit out in, they're in March, but as soon as I get into the new year, I anticipate the wait is not going to be anything with what, what it was having to manage both practices. And so, yeah, we, we understand it's, it's hard to wait when you're sick. So Well, thank you so much for everything you do. I love that you're holistic in your support. So it's not just SIRS and it's not just Lyme and it's not just heavy metals. You really look at the body as a whole and the environment or the terrain that we live in and including our own body. So, I mean, that's why I think you're one of my favorite SIRS providers to recommend for their treatment, but thank you so much for everything you do. I'm so thankful for your support and even being a resource out there because it is very difficult to find people, especially in the Lyme world that would do something other than antibiotics. So thank you. You're welcome. And thank you, Judy, for everything you do. (laughs) Thank you. Okay, guys, I hope that this conversation was helpful. I hope that it breaks down a lot of this illness not to be overwhelming. The key is that we need to keep our mind straight so that we're even in a rested state to start healing. When we are in a fight or flight or even in a free state, our body is not apt to heal. We need our immune system and our guard to get down and we be in more of a rest and digest calm state so that that is where immune health and healing can occur. So if you get overwhelmed and then you start this treatment with, well, I don't really want to do it or, oh my gosh, this is so overwhelming, but I guess I have to try that mindset is not the place that you can heal. So maybe it requires you to just take a pause a little bit and wait for that healing, at least in the mental side to happen. Maybe it requires some mind body healing, but just know that it is possible to heal from this and that just take it step by step, just like with a carnivore cures elimination diet or a meat only diet, you start with one meat at a time, and then you slowly add things back in. So 
I know it can be overwhelming to say, how can I reintroduce all the foods again in a standard American diet, which you probably don't want to add all that back in, but knowing that it's the same approach, whether you have lime mold, heavy metals, or even the dental cavitations, or maybe it's all of it. Just take it one step at a time, because really your mental health, your mindset, your immune health really needs you to take it one step and just be consistent and not be overwhelmed because this too shall pass. People do heal from this. I have crazy miracle stories that of people that are carnivore plus SIRS plus all this other stuff, and they do find healing. It just takes the right approach for you and to just be patient and to just go through the process. But healing is possible. I hope that this conversation provided you another lever for healing. And just know that whatever you're feeling today in mental health or illness, you can heal. And healing is always possible that you can have optimal health. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye, guys. 